Welcome to today's Bible teaching with Pastor Mike Bernard of Shoreline Community Church in North Bend, Oregon. We hope you will be blessed as we explore the riches of God's Word verse by verse. Please open your Bible and join us for today's message. Here's Pastor Mike. Would you open up your Bibles, please, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. And the title of the message today is going to be The Rapture of the Church. And once again, Father, thank you for this time that we can be here to study your word. I pray, Lord, that you would speak to each and every one of our hearts today as we work through this subject of hope and encouragement for each and every one of us. And we thank you, we love you, in Jesus' name, amen. If you're like me, uh, at different times in your life, you wonder what, what is going to happen at that moment of death. And so often we get frightened when we think about it in the future. In fact, people will spend a fortune in order to stay on this planet for a couple more days so that they don't have to face that. Have you ever had in your mind where you've just wondered, what, what if there is nothing to this? What if we come to that moment and when we die, there, there is nothing? That's it. That's the end. Wouldn't that be depressing if that were the case? I mean, you'd have every reason in the world to be grieving. But on the other hand, what's going to happen? Are we going to be aware of what's going on in our life when that moment comes? Are, 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 are we going to see everything that's happening and totally understand what's going on? What's going to happen to our loved ones? Our loved ones who believe. When we go to heaven, are we going to be able to recognize them? I mean, so many things go through our minds as we think about what that death might be like. You know, what, are, are we going to get to heaven be in the, the glory of God, spend an eternity with him? Are we going to be concerned about the things on earth? Well, I'm glad that the Bible talks about death. I'm glad the Bible talks about what happens after death. And we're going to take a look at one of the most incredible passages that deal with that today. So in verse 13, it says this. Paul writes this. He says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep sleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. I remember when I was a young man, uh, every now and then something would happen. Somebody would come up to me and say, you are ignorant. And I used to get upset. I used to take it as an insult until I came to find out what the word means. The word ignorant simply means not knowing. It's something that you do not know. And so when they say you're ignorant, what they're really saying is that you don't know. Well, that's exactly what the Apostle Paul is, is dealing with the Thessalonians here because false teachers apparently had spread into their midst and they were spreading the rumors that those who had died before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ somehow would miss out on that resurrection. They would miss out on those activities at that point. And the Thessalonians were troubled. And so Paul writes this in order to correct them and to correct the false teaching in which they had. They had this misunderstanding on death. And so what Paul does is he goes ahead and he likens this to sleep. Now this is pretty incredible because God, God works in mysterious ways, doesn't he? Isn't it interesting that, that you've all experienced, in fact, every single night for, for everybody on the earth, but especially for Christians, we play out that incredible drama of the resurrection. We go to bed and we are absolutely dead tired. Have you ever been there? You're just so exhausted. You are dead tired. You hit the pillow. You're out. But what happens several hours later? Morning comes, and you begin to wake up, and you rise, if you would, from the dead, and you begin to live a brand new day. Isn't that incredible? God designed us so that every night as we get our rest, that drama of the resurrection is portrayed in each and every one of our lives. We can look and see that's what's going to happen at that time in which we go to what seems to be sleep, which is death. 
Jesus used the metaphor, the simile of, of sleep in order to describe uh, Jairus' daughter. Uh, he was the ruler of the synagogue, and remember the story in Matthew chapter 9. She ends up dying. Everybody's in grief. Jesus walks into the ruler's house, and he looks, and he saw the flute players. He saw the noisy crowd that was wailing, and he said to them, make room, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And what did they do? And they mocked him, and they ridiculed him. She was dead. They had those people from the funeral, the, 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 the mourners that were there. And Jesus walks and says, she's not dead. She's sleeping. And so Jesus sent him away because they didn't believe. And he goes into the room, and he takes the girl by the hand, and she arose. She was only sleeping because she, she, that, that imagery was there in death. And if you've ever seen anyone in death, it looks like they're sleeping. And she arose. The Apostle Paul used the same figure of speech in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 when he was talking about the Lord's Supper, if you remember. Things had totally gotten out of control. And what was happening is the uh, people had made a mockery of communion. They'd come and the people who were wealthy would take whatever they wanted. They would eat as much as they wanted. They would drink as much as they wanted. In fact, we come to find out that they drank to the point in which they were even drunk at the Lord's Supper. And Paul is appalled by those things in which he sees. And he's telling them, look, you need to examine yourself before you do this. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 29 through 30, Paul writes this. He said, for he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. Now, once a month, at least, we have the Lord's Supper. We have communion. And one of the things that I always say is examine yourself to see if you're right with God, to see if you're right with others. Here's key words. As far as it be possible with you. Because we find that in the days of Paul, what were happening is that some of the people who were making a mockery of the Lord's Supper were becoming weak. They were becoming, uh, they were becoming sick. And it says, and many sleep. What does that mean? Their sin had led them to die. And that's the imagery that sleep is used for the believers. Isn't it interesting that when we're buried, we're usually buried in a cemetery? And the Greek word for cemetery is sleeping place. That's what it means. It's in the sleeping place. Well, there's some denominations out there that teach such a thing as soul sleep. And you wonder, well, what's that? At, at the moment of death, the soul goes to sleep until that time of the resurrection. And all of a sudden, the soul, uh, the spirit wake back up once again. But the New Testament doesn't teach that. In fact, we see it very clearly in the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Luke chapter 16, verses 19 30, uh, through 31. You remember the story there. You've got a certain rich man. This man's dressed in, in purple. He's got all of the money, all of the food that he needs. And there's a certain beggar by the name of Lazarus who would hang around and he would try just to get the crumbs that were coming off of his table. This man was so poor and so sick that he had sores on his bodies that the, that the dogs would come up and the dogs would begin to lick these sores. Well, it came to the point in which Lazarus died and he's ushered by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And a short time later, you've got the rich man who ends up dying and he's taken down to Hades. As the story develops here, we see that it's not very nice to be down in, in Hades. And, and, and the man cries out and he says, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water to cool my tongue, for I am tormented by this fire. Abraham says to him, look, during your life you had all kinds of stuff. You had all kinds of good stuff. And the implication here is, and frankly, you abused it. But this man, Lazarus, had nothing. And now things have been reversed, and he's getting good things, and you're getting bad things. And besides all of that, there's this great gulf that's between the two of us so that people from here can't go to there, and people from there can't go to here. Now, what's frightening about that is apparently they can see here. They understood what was going on. 
Now, this story is also often called the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. However, that, that word parable, anybody remember the meaning of it? A parable is an earthly story, remember, with a spiritual meaning. If, in fact, this is a parable, this is the only parable that names names. And so the question is, is this a real story or is this a parable? And that question is out there so that people, people don't, don't realize here. So, so you got the rich man who's in Hades and, and he's burning up. He's having, having a horrible time. And then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers that they may testify, t testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. And Abraham said to them, said to him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to them, if they don't hear Moses, if they don't hear the prophets, neither will they be persuaded by one who rises from the dead. This picture, who's it ultimately a picture of? Jesus was talking about himself. He was going to rise from the dead. He was going to go back to the Jewish people uh, through, through the prophets and, and, and through us today as we share, and yet so many of them weren't going to listen. But the point I wanted to bring up, you've got those who are, are teaching soul sleep, and Abraham, and Lazarus, and the rich men definitely were conscious. They understood exactly what was going on. You see, death is something that the believer doesn't have to be afraid of, but can actually look forward to. So we see in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, Paul writes this. He says, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed... By the way, if you go out and you build a house, usually you're going to build it really solid, aren't you, so that it lasts for a long time. But if you've got a tent that you're out in, what's the purpose of that tent? It's not going to stay in any place for any too long because you're going to fold that tent up, tent up and you're going to end up moving somewhere else. He said, for we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. This body that we have today isn't what we're going to have for all eternity, is it? One of these days, we're going to be clothed as believers in Christ with a body that is ready to last forever. And so, he says, for, for this we groan, earnestly desire to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For, for we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. One of the things that surprises me is as you get older, and I'm getting older, but as, as you get older, uh, the mind doesn't feel like you're old. You still feel like you're young. But when you go out and you try to do things with your body, it's just not there anymore. You just don't have the energy. You don't have the strength. And this tent is beginning to wear out. This tent is not prepared for eternity. But one of these days, we're going to get a new body that's going to be completely different. First Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 8 says this, So we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yet well pleased, pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. I think it's really important for us to understand because we got all of these misunderstandings about death right now, but one of the things that you can determine from 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, is that that moment of death, to be absent from the body, is to be what? present with the Lord. For the believer, our soul goes immediately into the presence of the Lord at death. And my understanding is without even having a loss of consciousness there. Well, death for the Christian is not a bad thing. In fact, Paul goes on and he writes in Philippians chapter 1, verses 23 through 24, he says, For I am hard-pressed between the two, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. So Paul's saying, you know, so many of us say, man, I'm going to spend every last dime I got because I, I don't want to die. I, I don't want this life to end. And what Paul is saying is, I want to check out. I want to get out of here now. But it's better for me to be here to help you in your spiritual growth at this time. 
And so, so often we look at death as a bad thing, but in fact, it's a very beautiful thing. As a young believer, I'd been discipled by a retired pastor 45 years, Jim C. Lander, and uh, he became part of our family. Uh, he was like a grandfather of my kids, and Jim passed away. And for me at that time, as a young Christian, death terrified me. I didn't want anything to do with it. When they had the memorial, I knew I had to go into the, uh, the, the uh, funeral parlor, and I just dreaded that. And so I walked in, and I, I looked over to the side, and there's the open casket, and there's Jim. And I walk up, my heart's just pounding because I don't want to be in there. And Jim kind of had a smile on his face. And I could hear his family in the background, almost like a party. They were laughing, they were talking. You know, they're just ha having a good time in the back, reminiscing. And I'm looking at my dead mentor in front of me. But through that, I learned that probably the happiest person in that room was Jim C. Lander. <laughs> he was in the presence of his Lord. He was gone from that tent. He was, he was out of there. But you walk into the funeral or the memorial of a non-believer and it is utter despair. It is agony. People crying out in pain because they don't have that hope. It's night and day between that of a believer and that of a non-believer. You see, Christians grieve when a brother or sister or family member in the Lord dies. But we don't have to grieve like the unbelievers who are around us who have no hope except for judgment. Verse 14 continues, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. You see, Christianity stands or falls on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, he's no different than anyone else who ever lived. But Jesus did, in fact, rise from the dead. And it has radically changed the lives of so many other people. You see, our salvation today is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Amen? And we look to the resurrection and that resurrection is God's stamp of approval on the redemptive work that Jesus did for you and for me. So for us to go to heaven, we've, we've got that promise. Jesus died, he rose again. As Jesus rose again, as the first fruits, we too will rise. But something has to happen to our bodies before we can spend eternity with God. There's a big change that has to come. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 through 52 says this. It says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. What does that mean? The way we are right now, with our physical bodies, we can't, we can't go to heaven for all eternity this way. We're dying. Something has to happen to each and every one of us. Now I say to you, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you, a mystery. A mystery is something that hadn't been revealed up to this point. Oh, the day of the Lord had been revealed in the Old Testament. But the rapture of the church hadn't. I tell you, a mystery we shall not all sleep. We're not all going to die. Something's going to happen. But we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Boom! That quick. In the moment, the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. These passages in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 describe the rapture of the church. John MacArthur writes this, he says, Paul affirmed that he taught the rapture as a heretofore hidden truth, 1 Corinthians 15, 51, or in other words, a mystery. Apparently the Thessalonians were informed fully about the day of the Lord, or that day of judgment, but not the preceding event, the rapture of the church. Until Paul revealed it as a revelation from God to him, it had been a secret. And only prior, the only prior mention being Jesus' teaching in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. This was new revelation of what had previously been unre an unrevealed mystery. Paul continues in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 53 through 57. And he says this, For this incorruptible must put on incorruption, 
And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has, has, been, has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin... I lost the word there. <laughs> and, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The, the sting of sin is death. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory of the Lord Jesus, in, in our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, there's a, a radical transformation that's going to be coming to each and every Christian. That means there's going to be no more sickness. There's going to be no more tears. There's going to be no more crying. There's going to be no more death. And because of this, verse 58 finishes a section where it says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. You see, it's really easy for us to get discouraged, doesn't it? Things don't go our way. We get sick when we're not expecting to get sick. We lose a job. Something happens. Something's always going to happen. Satan is always going to try to knock you out of your saddle. He's going to do the best that he can to discourage you, to stop you from growing spiritually. He's going to do the best that he can to stop you from moving forward and serving him, or serving, excuse me, and serving God with your life. And what Paul's saying here is, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. That means you stand fast, immovable, always doing the work of the Lord. Verse 15, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. We tell you this by the word of the Lord. Paul's saying, look, this is something, there's two possible interpretations. Either Paul received direct interpretation from the Lord Jesus Christ on this topic here, or maybe verbally down through the ages this has been passed from teachings that Jesus had been given while he walked on the earth. But these were comforting words for the Thessalonians who had lost loved ones. I mean, they expected the Lord to come at any moment, and then people started dying, and they began to wonder about their loved ones. Does that mean they're going to miss the coming of the Lord? Does that mean they're not going to be in the kingdom of God? Well, Jesus spoke about the rapture, as was mentioned by John MacArthur a little earlier in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, when he said this. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. Here you go. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may also be. What is my father's house? <laughs> That's in heaven. That's in heaven. You know, <laughs> we build a house now in, in a year. I mean, the Lord's gone, and uh, for 2,000 years, that his father's house has been, been there waiting. And, and in that house are many mansions or, or many, many rooms that Jesus has told us about. And he goes to prepare that place for us. What was Jesus' profession? It's carpenter. You know, you got all that imagery that's going on. He says, and, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Well, verse 15b says, who, we who are alive remain and, and remain will, not, will by no means precede those who are asleep. Paul fully expected the rapture to occur at any moment. You notice what he said? We who are alive. We who are alive. He was expecting it to happen. We find that the early church expected the rapture to happen at any moment. And I've got to tell you, so should we. And if we expected that the Lord could return at any moment, I think it would change the way in which we live our lives. If we knew that this could be the end of our life today, I think that we might act a little bit different than, than what we do. I wonder how it would affect our behavior if we realized the Lord would be coming back in a couple of hours here. Well, that their loved ones would not be left behind was great news to the Thessalonians. And now Paul begins to elaborate, verse 16, he says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So at the rapture, 
Christ will descend from heaven with a shout. But the question is, who shout? Is this the shout of Jesus? Do you remember when Lazarus was in the tomb and Jesus said to Lazarus, Lazarus, come out. And what happened? Lazarus arose and he came out. Or is this the shout of the archangel announcing that Jesus was arriving? In the Jewish wedding ceremony, what would happen is quite often the, 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 the group, the party would go at night when it was unexpected. And as they got there, as they arrived, the best man would shout out announcing the arrival of the wedding party. And here we see that Jesus is coming to take his bride. He's coming to take his bride home. And that's a possibility that it was probably Michael the archangel who gives this shout. Now, interestingly enough, the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus Christ is really Michael the Archangel. If they ever come to your door, knock on your door, start talking, asking you questions, ask them, who's Jesus? They believe he's a created being. But they also believe that he's Michael the Archangel. And that's going to be easily refuted when we go to Hebrews chapter 1. In fact, in Hebrews 1, verse 8, it says, But to the Son, he says, Your throne, O God. What's he called? Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. We move a few verses on to, to verses 10 through 12. And you, O Lord, in the beginning laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hand. They will perish, but you will remain. And they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not fail. We talk about Jesus. Who are we talking about? God manifest in the flesh. Verses 13 through 14 in Hebrews chapter 1. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who will inherit salvation? Here's the thing. Here's the easy solution. If Jesus was Michael the Archangel, and here in Hebrews chapter 13, verse, or chapter 1, verses 13 through 14, but to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand till, my, till, till I make your enemies your footstool? What, the, what would the obvious answer have been? Well, Jesus, of course. But Jesus isn't an archangel. Jesus is God. Very little, very little is known about the different ranks among the angels, but we do get a glimpse in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. It says this, He, meaning Jesus, is the in, uh, image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. By the way, when the Jehovah's Witnesses come to visit you, they're going to take a look at this verse, and they're going to point this out to you, and they're going to show you, look, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Bible says that Jesus is the firstborn of creation. That means he's a created being in order to back up their doctrine. How do you respond when they say something like that? You need to understand the Hebrew mindset. Because the firstborn means preeminent one. So let's go ahead and say that again with that understanding of what it means to be a Jew. He is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn, the preeminent one over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. What about those ranks of angels? Thrones or dominions, principalities, powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Interestingly enough, when you go to the New World Translation or the Jehovah's Witness Translation, they've changed all of the verses that deal with the deity of Jesus Christ so that they're different, and, and they lessen that deity of Christ. They try to take that away. So in this particular passage, what they've added in, in their New World Translation is all other things, all other things, all other things, because they don't want to identify Christ as, as God the Son, as God the creator of heaven and earth and who sustains all things. Well, 
Michael is actually uh, the only angel specifically named an archangel in the Bible. We see in the New Testament in Jude verse 8 and 9, there's no chapters other than one, and that's why you see the 8 and 9. In Jude verses 8 and 9, Jude writes this, he says, Likewise also, these dreamers defile their flesh, they reject authority, they speak evil of dignitaries, yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation. But he said, the Lord rebuke you. So clearly and specifically, we've got Michael named an archangel here. And I think it's interesting, so often today I hear people, people praying and they say, I rebuke you. Uh-uh. If even, the Mike, if even Michael the archangel says the Lord rebuke you, who are we to rebuke Satan head on? Go to Zechariah chapter 3, and you see the angel of the Lord there speaking. How does he deal with Satan? The Lord rebuke you. And I think it'd be wise for us in our own prayer life to realize the power that God has, and that when we're praying, that we ask the Lord, when we're dealing with things that are bigger than us, that we ask the Lord, the Lord rebuke you. Let the Lord go ahead and do that. What we see in Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9, it continues with Michael, and it says, And a war broke out in heaven, and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was their place found in, uh, for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, and who, and who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth. And his angels were cast down with him. And so once again, we see Michael out there battling Satan. Every time we turn around, he's battling Satan, and usually on behalf of the Jews. We see him mentioned in the Old Testament. In fact, in Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 through, through 2, it says, At that time Michael shall stand up, that great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. He seemed to be the defender of Israel. And there shall be a time of trouble such as has never been since, since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting content, contempt. When we look at this, one of the things that we realize clearly is that there will be a double resurrection. So often we just think that, that the just are going to be resurrected physically. But what we find out in Daniel is that even the unjust are going to be resurrected physically in a body that not is prepared for heaven, but in a body that is prepared for eternity in hell. Although Michael was the only archangel that was named in the Bible, it's possible that there were actually many more. Daniel chapter 13, it says this, it says, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia, this is the angel that's talking to, to Daniel in, in, in his vision, it says, but the prince of the, of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, and behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the king of Persia. So you got this incredible uh, battle that's going on, and this angel is absolutely exhausted, and then finally Michael comes along to help. But how is Michael identified in this? One of the chief princes. So it's possible that there's more than, than one archangel. Well, the only other good angel that's named in the Bible is Gabriel. And what's interesting, you know, people ask, is, is Gabriel an archangel? But what's interesting there is uh, when you look in the scriptures, when you see Gabriel described, he's not described as an archangel, he's described as an angel. And every time we see Gabriel, it has to do with the birth of Christ. Somehow he's announcing the timing in Daniel, or he's, he's announcing to Zechariah, he, he's announcing to, to Mary and Joseph, he's announcing the, the birth of Jesus Christ. In 1768, a manuscript was, was found, which is uh, the Book of Enoch that's been around. I don't know how many of you have read it. I've actually read through, through that book. But it was found in Ethiopia by a Scotsman by the name of James Bruce. And the manuscript in the Book of Enoch lists four archangels. And this is what it lists. It lists Michael, it lists Raphael, it lists Gabriel, and, and Phanuel. Now, the Book of Enoch, first of all, who's Enoch? 
Enoch was before the flood. My question here is how is this book here? How did it make it through the flood? That would be the question that, that I would have on all of this. Uh, does the book of Enoch or any other book that's out there, the Gospel of Thomas or all of these other books, do they measure up with scripture? Do they have the same authority as scripture? Absolutely not. And when you read them, it may be interesting what you read, but instantly as you read through, you can tell the difference between what you read in the Word of God and what you read in these other books. But I'm just throwing this out there because many have said that Michael's an archangel, many have said Gabriel's an archangel, and they've got these other names that are thrown out there as well. Question for you here as we're talking about angels and before we move on. Have you ever noticed when you go into the store, especially this time of year, and you look at the pictures of angels, what do you see? Woman angels. You go for your Christmas decorations, what do you see? Woman angels. Let me ask you this question. How many woman angels are found in the Bible? Anybody know? Zero. And it makes you wonder why that happens. Why, why when you, you go out there in commerce, everything is woman angels. And I've got to tell you that Satan is the father of lies. He's doing everything that he can to distract you and to pull you away from the truth of God's word. A few days back, we celebrated Halloween, and I, the kids get so excited during that time with the candy and everything else, but it's so easy for us to miss the significance of October 31st, because on October 31st, it was the day that Martin Luther went and he hammered the 95 Thesis to the door at the church in Wittenberg, which began what we call the Reformation. And what was the significance of the Reformation? After so long of going astray, finally, the biblical gospel was rediscovered. What's that biblical gospel? That we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Isn't it like Satan to come along with something nice, candy for children, that would bring the focus away from that and put it on him? And, you know, it's, it's, it's funny that we watch the father of lies, but Satan's not only a father of lies, he's a fallen angel. In fact, he was a guardian cherub, an incredibly beautiful guardian cherub. Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 14 through 15 and 17 says this, it says, You were the anointed cherub who covers, who established, I, I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. By God, Satan was a guardian cherub. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day in which you were created. Satan was created. From the day in which you were created till iniquity was found in you. God didn't create sin. He created Satan mutable. He was created with the ability to choose right or the ability to choose wrong. And he chose wrong. You were perfect in your ways from the days that you were created till iniquity was found in you. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty, your pride, perhaps the most beautiful of the angels in heaven. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor, and I cast you down to the ground. Isaiah talks about this as well in Isaiah 14, verses 12 and 13. How, are, how, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars or above the angels of God. I will also sit on the mountain of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. You ready for this? I will be like the Most High. What's Satan saying? I will be like God. Yet you shall be brought low to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the earth. You know, Mormonism wrongly believes that Jesus and Lucifer are spirit brothers. In fact, if you go in the Doctrine and Covenants, one of the authoritative books that they believe in, in Doctrine and Covenants 9321, it describes the two as being spirit brothers, equals and opposites, if you would. There's no equals and opposites about it. Jesus is God in the flesh. He's the creator of the universe. Well, Satan, or Lucifer, is a created being. He is a, a creature. He's on a leash. In fact, he's a dog on a leash he, who can only go so far. And that's why he's so dangerous right now. He's mad and he bites. 
Well, verse 16 continues and says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise. The trumpet in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, is clearly the same trumpet that we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 through 53. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. We talked about that already. Nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, boom, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruption must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. You see, the last trumpet has been believed by some to, to, uh, to be, take place in the middle of the tribulation period. But that trumpet in Revelation chapter 11, verses 15 through 19, is to call down judgment upon the earth. Well, the trumpet in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is to call dead believers up from the grave and to receive their bodies, their glorified bodies, to be with the Lord forever. There's two very different purposes in these trumpets. Well, our resurrection bodies will be physical bodies. They'll be glorified bodies. They'll be bodies like the body of Jesus. In John chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 2, John writes this. He said, Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we should be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope purifies himself, just as he is purified. Now, it has not yet been revealed what we should be, but we know that when he is revealed, when Jesus is revealed at the end time, that we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Well, verse 17 continues, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet with the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Here we see one of the clearest teachings in the Bible on the rapture of the church. The word rapture or rapturo comes from the Latin Vulgate, which means caught up. The Greek word harp harpazo means to snatch, it means to, to seize. It denotes a sudden, violent taking away. Do you normally think of the rapture that way? It's not just an easy going up. This is a sudden, violent taking away. You're, you're there. You're, you're living your life. Boom! You're gone. And that's the imagery that, that's going on. The result of the sudden taking away is that we are caught up to the Lord in the air. It's interesting because Satan claims, he claims the power of the air for himself. Take a look at Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 2. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once watched, walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. The prince of the power of the air. Is there any doubt at all that Satan is very active in the airwaves today? All you got to do is watch your television channels. All you got to do is listen to the radio and the, some of the music that's, that's coming out. He's very much involved in the airwaves today. William McDonald says the air is Satan's sphere. We see that in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2. So this is a triumphal gathering and open defiance of the devil's right to his own stronghold. Isn't that like the Lord? If he's going to call us home, he's going to go right to Satan's stronghold. And he's going to put us right there. And he goes in and he claims that territory. And it's going to happen fast. Believers won't have a chance to have any doubts. They won't have the chance to have any, any second thoughts. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 52. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We're not all going to sleep. Not everybody has to die. By the way, there's two people in the history of the world who have never died. Who are those two people? Enoch and Elijah. They may end up being the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11, in, in the book of Revelation. Uh, but, but something's got to happen. It says, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for that trumpet's going to sound, and the dead of Christ, in Christ will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed forever.
John MacArthur says, this trumpet is not the judgment trumpets of Revelation chapter 8, verses uh, 8 through 11, but is illustrated by the trumpet of Exodus 19, verses 16 through 19, which called the people out of the camp to meet God. It will be the trumpet of deliverance. And at that moment, the moment of the rapture, we will be instantly and radically transformed to our glorified bodies, prepared for eternity. God's going to call us home. Have you ever had someone ask you, uh, where's your citizenship? You know, I mean, uh, I came from Canada. I'm a citizen of the United States now. But sometimes people will ask, you know, what is your citizenship? Especially if you've got a, an accent. Are you a citizen of the United States? Are you a citizen of somewhere else? Where is your citizenship? And one of the things that we find out in Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 through 21, is that our citizenship isn't here. Ultimately, our citizenship is in heaven. Philippians 3, 20 through 21 says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that, is made, that, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able to subdue all things to himself. Wow, these bodies that are getting older, one of these days, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, if we're alive at the return of Christ, we will be transformed. How about people who have died? How about people who have been cremated and they've had their ashes scattered in the sea? I take you back to, to the book of Genesis and how was that first man made it? God took the dust of the ground and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. And i got to tell you, if God can do that for the first, first man, he can raise us from the ashes of cremation. Amen? Amen? Verse 18 continues and says, Therefore comfort one another with these words. This hope that we have should be an encouragement to every believer as we go through the difficult times in life. Several years ago, I had a friend, an old Messianic Jew. I've used this illustration many times, but I don't know of one more powerful. He had a stroke, and he had trouble talking at times, and he said, I, I can't talk, but when he would talk, things would just jump. They would be there. And uh, my friend Bill Gamberg said one day his 56-year-old son died, and they asked him to speak at the memorial, and so Bill said that he would. And Bill told me, he said, you know, I was there at that memorial, and I was, I was, I was sharing, and suddenly it struck me. I looked around at the faces of the people, and there was so much grief. And he said, I stopped and I looked back at the coffin with my son in, in it. And he said, suddenly I realized it. He said, this is so depressing. Why do we call that a coffin? Why don't we call it what it really is? It's a hope chest. And what do we do with a hope chest? We put those things that are precious to us in that hope chest to put them away for a better day, to bring them back out again. Amen? Sola Levitt said this. He said, you know, it's too bad that we as Christians have to go out and buy our burial plots. What a waste. It's too bad we can't rent them because you can't keep a Christian down. The Christian is always going to rise again. Well, when will that future rapture occur? There's several different beliefs in Christianity. Some believe in the pre-tribulational rapture, in other words, at, at the beginning of the tribulation, before the millennium. Others believe that that moment is going to be um, the mid-tribulation rapture of the church, right at, in the middle of the tribulation at the seventh trumpet. Other Christians believe that that rapture is going to be post-tribulation. In other words, it's going to happen at the end of the seven-year tribulation. Others believe, in fact, probably the majority of Christianity believes that the rapture is going to take place at the second coming of Christ just before the eternal estate takes place or that eternal state and everything's going to end up happening at one time. John MacArthur falls into the pre-tribulational rapture of the church camp and I just wanted to read a few of his words. He says this, this passage along with John 14 verses 1 through 3 and 1 Corinthians 15 51 through 52 form the biblical basis for the rapture of the church. The time of the rapture cannot be conclusively determined from this passage alone. However, when other texts such as Revelation chapter 3 verse 10 and John 14 3 are consulted and compared to the texts about 
about Christ coming to judgment. Matthew 13, Matthew 24, Revelation 19. At the end of the seven-year tribulation, it has been noted that there is a clear difference between the character of the rapture and that there is no mention of any judgment. Well, the other texts feature judgment. So then, it is best to understand that the rapture occurs at, the t at a time different from the coming of Christ in judgment. Thus, the rapture has been described as pre-tribulational before the wrath of God unfolded in the judgments of Revelation 6 through 19. This event includes complete transformation in union with the Lord Jesus Christ that never ends you know, others would believe, uh, like I said earlier, that, that the uh, rapture could occur in the mid-tribulation. Others would believe that the rapture occurs at the end of the tribulation before the millennial reign. Most older Christian denominations believe the rapture will coincide with the second coming of Christ in judgment at the end time, and everything will happen at once. Today we see uh, modern dispensationalism is really popular, but what we don't realize is that this modern form of dispensational, uh, dispensationalism actually came towards the end of the 1800s. You had John Darby, you had C.I. Schofield. C.I. Schofield with the Schofield Bible really uh, brought forth that system uh, of belief, and a lot of the people who would fall into the premillennial camp, which I do, by the way, would, would fall into that. Many also point back to historic premillennialism in the first four centuries, where the regular dispensationalism points to, dispensationalists point to the pre-tribulational rapture, the historic millennialists point to the post-tribulation rapture. And then, uh, you know, people have, have struggled with that over the years. Uh, my, my answer to all of this is it's all going to pan out in the end, okay? But um, I've leaned towards the pre-tribulational rapture of the church, and I just wanted to share with you one of the most intriguing arguments that I've seen, and maybe that will help you. Have you ever noticed that the life of Jesus seems to revolve around the seven feasts of Israel? What are those? You've got Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and tabernacles. That's the order in which the seven feasts of Israel are laid out. Now to see something interesting, what we realize here is that three of these come together really quickly. In fact, when we go back in history, we go back to the crucifixion of Christ, we find that Christ was crucified on the Passover. The very next day, he was buried on unleavened bread. The very next day, he rose again on first fruits as the first fruit of those who would follow after him. There's a period of time that goes by. In fact, you've got 50 days that go by. And for the Jewish people, when they looked at Pentecost, at Pentecost, they celebrated the giving of the law. But for Christians today, we celebrate the giving of the Holy Spirit. Those events are past. Those events have happened. Now, in the Jewish calendar, there's a long separation from the first month of the year to the seventh month of the year in which, once again, three things come together, and they happen really quickly. We see that the fifth feast is that feast of trumpets. Is it possible that trumpets, like we've seen today, is the calling up? Is it possible that trump trumpets points to the rapture? And then next we see the Day of Atonement. Well, we see tremendous suffering that takes place, and is that the seven-year tribulation? And then last we see tabernacles, and tabernacles may point to the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, that thousand-year reign. And if that pattern sets, sets loose, we've had the first four happen, we haven't had the last. Look at the order in which it happens. And that may be a pretty strong argument for all of that. Well, I was sitting down with my daughter, Jessie, over dinner, the other theologian in the family, and we were talking about this. And she looks at me so simple, and she goes, Dad, she goes, nobody knows the day nor the hour. And she is so right. Jesus said in Mark chapter 13, verses 32 through 33, he said, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, here's a surprising one, nor the Son in his humanity, 
But, it, but, the, uh, but of the day and the hour, no one knows, knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Take heed, watch, and pray, for you do not know when this time will be. You see, the Apostle Paul lived every day as if it was his last. So should we. If you knew that this was your last day on earth, if you knew that you wouldn't have another chance to talk to your family members, would you say something maybe a little bit differently than you would normally say to them? Would you be more inclined to reach out to them with the gospel of Christ if you knew the end was coming? And I just want to encourage each and every one of us that this text is to be an encouragement for you and for me that at any moment the Lord Jesus could return, that we would be called, that the dead in Christ will rise and then we'll be with them forever. But more importantly, we'll be with him. We'll be with Jesus forever. Does that excite you? I'll tell you what, it should. Lord, thank you for your word and thank you for this encouragement. And Lord, even though I, I don't know that this side of eternity that anyone, well, this side of, of um, your return that anyone can totally pinpoint this time here. But Lord, each of us should, should live our life to the full, realizing that you are coming back, that you will return, and that in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, that we could be radically transformed to have our glorified bodies, which will never die again, which will never get sick again. And Lord, we, we love you, and we look forward to that day. And I think of what the Apostle John said at the end of the Bible, at the end of the book of Revelation, come, Lord Jesus, come. Lord, if there's anyone here today who's never received Christ as Savior, I, I pray that today would be the day, that they wouldn't walk out of here because you could come back today, that they would say a prayer like this to get right with you, Lord, not that it's magical words in a prayer. But Lord, it's the state of the heart. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. I have sinned. I have done wrong. I have so messed up, but I repent. I change my mind. I change my direction. I ask, Lord, that you would come into my heart and help me to be the kind of person that you desire for me to be. For it's in Jesus' most precious name. Amen.